Um, thanks, uh, Rami, for the introduction. So um, uh, I'm not going to be talking about uh, a lot of data analysis or uh, espresso machine modification today. I'll be talking about JavaScript for data visualization. Um, so in case you want to follow along, uh, all of these slides are available right now at uh, bit.ly slash js-open-mtl-nic. So feel free to take pictures of the slides if you like, but you have the full fidelity version right here. And I'll be uh, providing this recording works. I will be uh, posting the recording online as well. So a little bit about me. Uh, I currently work at uh, Datacratic. We're a Montreal-based company. We're building a machine learning database. They gave me some time off to come uh, give this talk today. So here's the Datacratic logo. Uh, you should check out our product, mldb.ai. Uh, it's really cool, but that's all I'll say about that here. Um, Within the JavaScript community, I'm uh, better known as the author of the pivottable.js library, which is a JavaScript uh, drag and drop pivot table implementation, uh, which is fairly popular. And I'm sort of an all around data visualization uh, enthusiast. Uh, I don't know that any of my visualizations have ever made it to the paper, but I, uh, they talked about my data visualization work on the radio once, which was kind of neat, because you can't really see anything on the radio. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, here's just some of my work. Um, up in the corner, you know, I made uh, some, um, some family trees. I've made some maps of Montreal. I made a map of Reddit, all the different subreddits in Reddit. I've made some dashboards. Uh, I made um, a sort of real-time election night dashboard uh, that was projected uh, at, a, at a sort of a elect uh, sorry, municipal political party uh, event. And I did some uh, a fair bit of analysis of the last uh, of the results of the last municipal election here in Montreal. Um, so you know, this is some some of the things uh, I've worked on. I'll be kind of showing uh, one of these today. Um, but uh, just to give you kind of a flavor of what sort of data visualization is for those who kind of maybe have a, a loose grasp on the term, uh, data visualization is basically making pictures with data. I'm not going to give like a super formal definition here, but, but I need to refer to this a little bit later on in my talk. Basically, data visualization operates by mapping data variables, like when you have a, you know, a spreadsheet or something, to visual variables. So what I mean by that is um, here's a list of essentially what you know, various researchers in, uh, in data visualization have, have agreed is, uh, are the, the visual variables that humans are capable of, of, uh, of processing and sort of reasoning about. So anytime you are making any kind of data visualization, you're making kind of marks on a screen or on a piece of paper. And these marks have all of these attributes, right? They've got a position, they're somewhere on the, on the image. They've got a size, they've got a color hue, they've got a color intensity, they have a shape, a texture, an orientation, they may be touching each other or they're connected in some way. So these are the visual variables that all of the marks uh, in, a, in a graphic essentially have. And data visualization uh, as an activity is the process of mapping elements of data. Let's say you have a spreadsheet and you have a whole bunch of columns. You're saying this column, I'm going to attach, I'm going to link this column to the position of a dot on my, on my graph or uh, to the orientation of a line in my graphic. So to kind of illustrate, uh, illustrate this sort of slightly abstract concept, this is probably the most abstract slide I've got, I'm going to show you uh, a little piece of work that I did after the last uh, municipal election here in Montreal. So here's a map of Montreal. Um, the data that I'm visualizing here are essentially election returns. So Montreal is divided up into 19 boroughs. Uh, these boroughs are, again, subdivided into something like 54 different electoral districts. Um, and in the last municipal election, there were sort of three major candidates, uh, Denis Coderre, who ended up winning the election, Richard Bergeron, and Mélanie Joly. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to sort of visualize some of this data and play with some, some web technologies. This here is built using, using D3. Um, and so what I did uh, down, in the, down the right here is pretty simple. It's a map, right? So essentially, uh, each electoral district is represented by a shape which is the shape of the electoral district, and its position is wherever the electoral district is on the map. So that's kind of an, uh, an encoding that people are, are fairly familiar with, right? A map is sort of, you represent things where they are. The color of each electoral district is a blend of, uh, the, the, sorry, it's a blend of three colors in proportion to the results that each of the three candidates got. So Mélanie Joly I chose to represent in blue, Richard Bergeron in green, and Denis Coderre in red. So sort of the more red the shape is, the more uh, Denis Coderre got, got votes. The more green it is, the more Richard Bergeron got votes. So that's pretty simple. Everyone knows this. I'm kind of telling you what you already know. Um, up in the, the left here, you have what's called a ternary chart. It's a triangle. And basically, you've got Coderre in the corner, uh, in the corner closest to me, Richard Bergeron and Mélanie Jolie. 
And uh, I've also represented each of the electoral districts in Montreal by a circle in this triangle. And so the closer the, the circle is to a corner of the triangle, the more that candidate got votes. And it turns out that, um, sorry, and I also sized each circle according to the number of votes in each district. And I linked the two together, and I hope this uh, renders on the screen here. Can you guys see how you've got a circle lighting up here as I move my mouse around? So you can see how this circle here uh, is reasonably big. It's one of the bigger boroughs, and it lights up, uh, and it's one of, the, one of the boroughs down here in the middle. Um, so you can kind of see the linkage between the, uh, the ternary plot here and the map in the corner. And so I've mapped, I'm, I'm trying to essentially with this uh, visualization to show the correspondence between the spatial mapping up here in the triangle um, and the colors down here in the map to show, uh, you know, how essentially this, bor this, uh, this district is here in the map and it's here near the center, I don't know if you can see, up oh, near, uh, near the edge, uh, in the triangle. So this is sort of two different ways of representing essentially the same data set by mapping the different elements to different visual variables. And this is essentially what, what data visualization is all about. Um, so with that being said, um, the main sort of thesis of my talk is that JavaScript uh, is the tool of choice for, for interactive data visualization. So, um, you know, one of the presentations a little earlier was kind of talking about battles between different frameworks. Uh, there's all sorts of, you know, in the tech industry, there's all sorts of like this versus that, which is going to win the whatever battle. Uh, you know, in, in data analysis, there's a lot of like R versus Python. Hadoop versus Spark, all these sort of big data wars. The nice thing for JavaScript developers is that there is no JavaScript versus anything for, inter for uh, interactive data visualization. It's just JavaScript. <laughs> um, anytime you, you're working in R or Python to do data analysis and you see an interactive visualization, that library is generating JavaScript and displaying it in a browser. So JavaScript, you know, it's not even that it won the battle, there just was no particular battle for interactive uh, data visualization. And the reason for that is because essentially, I mean, everyone's got a browser. I mean, it's the same reason why we use web applications to deliver, uh, to deliver a whole bunch of, of, uh, of functionality to users. Everyone's got a browser. These browsers uh, are, are easy to script in JavaScript and hard to script in anything else. And so that's why you use, uh, why you use JavaScript. Um, Unfortunately, uh, like, like everything else in JavaScript, <laughs> there's sort of too many libraries to choose from if you want to do data visualization in JavaScript. Um, in fact, too many libraries to choose from. I can't even uh, really sort of go over all of them in this talk and give you a kind of a recommendation. This is the one you should use. Uh, so when I sort of sat down and tried planning out this talk, I figured I would sort of explain how I see the JavaScript data visualization stack and give you kind of a framework to figure out which library you should use when and why. So that's essentially the, uh, the outline of my talk. Um, I'll be presenting essentially the, this little stack here. Um, it's, it's not a very you know, revolutionary way of looking at things, but essentially I'll be talking first about the lowest level uh, of, the, of the stack, which is the basic graphics APIs, which are provided to you as, ja as JavaScript developers by the browser. Essentially they're SVG and Canvas. Um, then the sort of next level of the stack is sort of visualization middleware. Uh, the, probably the best example of that is D3.js. When I tell people uh, I, do, I do visualization in JavaScript, everyone's like, yeah, D3. And I'm like, well, sometimes D3, sometimes other things. So um, I'll try and justify that, uh, that statement. And then uh, at the sort of highest level of abstraction, and last on my list here, um, I'll talk about what you can call charting libraries, but I'm going to be talk, call, calling visualization template libraries, sort of very high level libraries for making charts. Um, so let's uh, dive right in. Um, in terms of graphics APIs, the modern browsers provide you essentially two major ways of doing things. You've got SVG, Scalable Vector Graphics, um, which is essentially an XML specification for vector graphics. Um, and you've got Canvas, which is sort of better known as, you know, the Canvas tag in HTML5. Um, so, you know, a lot of, many, many pixels have been spilled about the various merits and demerits of each. I'll kind of summarize the, uh, uh, the comparison of the two here. Um, SVG, Working with SVG is a lot like working with HTML or CSS. SVG, it's an XML document, it has a DOM, you can generate elements, they've got parents, you can attach them to things. Um, you know, it feels a lot like working with jQuery, although jQuery natively, I believe, can't generate SVG elements. Um, and uh, that's what we call essentially a retained mode graphics API. So when you create a circle in SVG and you sort of put it somewhere uh, in a graphic, there's a circle there. You can go, go back, you can give it an ID, you can refer to it by ID, you can change its position later. Uh, the browser knows that there's a, there's a circle there. 
Canvas, on the other hand, there's no DOM. It's basically like drawing an image pixel by pixel. In a, in a Canvas tag, you can draw a circle. You can get Canvas to draw a circle for you. But once it's done, you can't get Canvas to give you a handle back to that circle. You can't move that circle. It's just a bunch of pixels that happen to be in the shape of a circle on the screen. That's called an immediate mode graphics API because you're just sort of painting pixels on the screen and then, and then there they are. One of the biggest sort of outcomes of this difference, uh, the way it's, it's manifested for a developer, is that in SVG, you essentially you have an event model, just like in HTML. In HTML, you can attach sort of an on-click event to, uh, to a button, and when you, you know, the, the browser, when you click on the button, will fire that on-click event for you. In, in SVG, it's very similar. You can attach events to SVG. In Canvas, because Canvas doesn't know that a circle is a circle, it's just got a bunch of pixels, you can't really do that. In Canvas, you can know, as a developer, you can write code that knows uh, that the mouse is over the canvas, and you can know the position of the mouse, but when the user clicks there, all you have is the XY coordinate of where the mouse clicked. You have to go figure out, does that line up with something that I drew before, and should I do something about that? So there's no real events model provided to you by the browser uh, when you're using Canvas. So um, one of the major things you'll, you'll read about uh, if you sort of Google you know, SVG versus Canvas um, is you'll find, you know, Canvas is more scalable. No, SVG is more scalable. Um, turns out it depends with respect to what, right? Uh, SVG sort of, uh, I shouldn't say scales with the number of elements, it's uh, performance degrades with the number of elements. The more uh, elements you have in an SVG, the slower it will behave when you're trying to sort of drag them around uh, and, and operate on them. Just kind of like a normal HTML page, right? We, you have a, a vast number of HTML elements on the page, it's gonna start to lag a little bit. Canvas, on the other hand, the, the scalability is with respect to the size of the drawing area. So the more pixels you have, if you have to redraw your canvas all the time, the longer it's going to take. But because you're just drawing pixels, uh, canvas doesn't really care if those pixels represent five elements or 50,000 elements. You just got a bunch of pixels on the screen. So the scalability characteristics of SVG and canvas sort of depend on what you're trying to do. Uh, with, this, with the sort of big caveat that uh, canvas has a sort of performance secret weapon, which is WebGL. So, WebGL is really cool because it allows you to program a supercomputer in JavaScript. Back in the 80s, there was these sort of big, you know, funky-shaped supercomputers called Craze, and they operated in parallel, and we we're going to use them to do all sorts of funky stuff, like simulate the weather. Um, turns out we have one of these supercomputers in our pockets most of the time now, or in our laptops. It's the GPU. It's the, the graphical processing unit uh, of your computer. Uh, it's a parallel supercomputer, essentially, that's able to, to compute certain types of things much, much faster than the CPU. And WebGL is the sort of web binding, the JavaScript access layer to OpenGL, which is the way that you program a GPU. So if you want to do high-performance 3D graphics, or if you want to have, you know, hundreds of thousands of points dancing about on your screen, uh, you're going to be pretty sad if you try and do that in SVG, but WebGL just, with, with, FGL, with WebGL, your, your GPU is just going to have that for breakfast. So let me give you kind of an example uh, of that. I didn't make this, but, uh, but I think it's a neat, it's a neat example. Um, hopefully the internet is sufficient to make this work. Maybe. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. So you can see it's, got, it's building the models in the corner. Um, this is essentially, um, this is a canvas here on the, on the left-hand side of the screen, and it's drawn this funky-looking map and I'm rotating it in 3D, and this is all written in JavaScript using WebGL. Um, so in terms of mapping, you know, I'm mapping the position of the Earth onto this 2D representation of a globe, and I'm, what, I'm, uh, what, I'm, what we're visualizing here, I didn't do this, is uh, the different uh, airline routes that exist uh, from different uh, um, uh, airline, airlines, and so you can sort of turn them on, turn them off. This is a, you know, interactive JavaScript visualization, and I can sort of mouse over them, and it lights up the right ones, and um, I thought I could zoom. Oh, yeah, I can zoom. Uh, no, this is just the browser zooming. But anyway, uh, with the scroll wheel, you can zoom. <laughs> um, so this this is the kind of thing that you can do with WebGL, and it starts to look a little bit like a computer game because, well, you know, GPU programming essentially is what game developers do. So you can do this in JavaScript now, and this is essentially a feature uh, of the Canvas API that has nothing to do with SVG. So that kind of covers the the, the, the lowest level of the, the JavaScript. Uh, data visualization stack, the, the two graphics APIs that you have access to. The second layer of the visualization stack I'm calling the sort of visualization middleware libraries. Just to give you a flavor of what I'm talking about, 
D3.js, uh, I, would, I would put it this layer of the stack. It's a, it's a middleware library. Um, Fabric.js is essentially a library that you can layer on top of Canvas to do um, hovers and drags and that sort of thing. So some of the things that aren't built into the Canvas or that are not provided uh, by the browser for you when you work with Canvas, Fabric will give, will give to you. Uh, and Philo.gl, the third one here, is, uh, is the library that was used to, to make that uh, cool airline globe uh, visualization. So it provides some functionality on top of WebGL to do this kind of thing. So the thing these middleware libraries all have in common is they either wrap or augment the graphics APIs that the browser provides to you. You can think about it a little bit like jQuery for data visualization, right? jQuery, you know, much as it's potentially been replaced or, or uh, made outdated by various uh, new frameworks, essentially kind of wrapped the DOM and made it easier to work with by adding stuff like selectors, by having a nice chaining API, made it easier to use. Um, some of these uh, visualization middleware libraries essentially do that for either SVG or Canvas or MGL um, and give you a whole bunch of sort of other little helpers, much like jQuery did for your tra traditional kind of um, Ajax, as we used to call it back in the day, uh, type interaction. So the things that most visualization middleware will give you uh, are, sorry, the, the functionality it'll give you are stuff like uh, helpers for data, ma data manipulation, layout, uh, animation interaction. So Data manipulation is really important when you're doing data visualization because you often have some kind of data in some kind of format, and it is exceedingly rare that the format that the data comes in uh, is the format that you need, it, you need it to be in in order to, to do any kind of meaningful visualization. So you need some sort of data visualization, uh, sorry, data manipulation tools more powerful than just a for loop in order to sort of transform your data into the way you need it to look. Um, layout generally is kind of one of the most important uh, parts of the mapping of uh, data variables to visual variables is sort of figuring out where things should be on the screen. That's essentially a layout problem, right? I knew when I built my little triangle that I wanted uh, the dot that represents uh, a given electoral district, if they got more votes uh, for a given candidate, to be closer to that candidate's triangle. It's a fair bit of math that I had to do there. I had to figure out where in the triangle it should be, I had to figure out where the triangle should be on the screen, and therefore where the dot should be in the triangle. Um, some of these uh, middleware libraries give you essentially functionality for, for doing that automatically. And then finally, if you want to do animation and interaction, um, obviously you can, you can code that yourself, but middleware libraries provide you a bunch of helpers for that. So as an example, D3.js, which is one of the most sort of popular data visualization libraries uh, in, uh, in the JavaScript world, is sort of one big toolbox for all this stuff, right? You've got sort of a DOM manipulation uh, uh, submodule within uh, within D3, a little bit like jQuery's. In fact, I saw a neat little blog post the other day that said, oh, you know, forget D3, forget uh, jQuery. You can actually just use D3 to manipulate your DOM. I think that's a little extreme, but, um, you know, it's, it's kind of neat. You can do selection a little bit like, like jQuery. Um, D3 has a whole, a whole bunch of tools that dedicated to uh, downloading and parsing CSVs, TSVs, comma-separated value files, JSON files. Um, you can have sort of geo-JSON files that represent maps and, uh, and uh, subdivisions of space like I have in my, uh, in my map of Montreal. Uh, geographical projections, very, very important uh, when you're representing a globe. You can't actually represent, obviously, a 3D thing on a 2D surface, so you need to project it somehow, either, either like unroll it or just show a part of it. Um, you can do graph layout, you can do animations. These are all sort of building blocks that D3 provides to you in order to make your, uh, your visualization look the way that you want to. Sort of to fill in the blanks between I've got my data over here and I've got my visual variables over here and how do I map the two together. And D3 has a lot of built-in support for uh, interacting with the SVG graphics API. In fact, most of the examples you'll see if you go to d3js.org and sort of all over the web kind of implicitly will use SVG without really telling you that that's what's happening. But you can also target uh, the Canvas API with D3, and I've linked a, a neat blog post that kind of explains to you how you can use uh, all of the data binding, data manipulation, parsing, layout uh, functionality of D3 while targeting the Canvas element. So that's kind of where I see D3 fitting into, into the stack. Excuse me. And uh, the final layer of the JavaScript data visualization stack is what I'll call visualization template libraries or charting libraries. So anybody you know old enough to use uh, I don't even know what version of Excel this is Excel 2000 let's say um, will remember that you know when you wanted to make a graph or a chart um, this this little window would pop up and like for a long time when I was when I was uh, when I was young and, and and not as modest I was like oh, I know everything there is to know about data visualization I know every little uh, 
every template in this chart uh, window. <laughs> so the way the way I look at sort of visualization template libraries is a very evolved version of this uh, of this picker. Essentially, um, all these libraries that I've listed here: Chart.js, Google Charts, High Charts, Flot. There's dozens and dozens of these. Um, if you if you kind of look at the API, there's either a method called you know make pie chart, make line chart, make bar chart. You can kind of run down this list here, and there's a, a lot of them are there. Uh, or there's sort of one big method called make chart, but then somewhere in there there's a parameter mode equals pie chart, mode equals line chart. Um, the thing that kind of ties all these libraries together is that there's a set number of things that the designer of these libraries has uh, kind of wanted to make it easy for you to make. Uh, and you call a method and you, and you can kind of do that. Um, and then within that, you know, the, it's more or less kind of customizable. They let you change the colors, they let you change the position of certain things. But fundamentally, you know, a line chart is a line chart in general. Uh, the, the line will march to the left, uh, to the right across the screen, connecting all the points. There's an axis, maybe you can turn the axis off. There's, there's ticks, that sort of thing. Um, and this is, uh, this is very, very useful in, in a lot of contexts, but it doesn't allow you sort of the full freedom of positioning graphic elements wherever you want and, and mapping things kind of, uh, kind of arbitrarily. For example, the, the linked kind of map ternary plot that I made, there's no template for that anywhere in, uh, in any of these libraries that I've ever found. So let me give you kind of the, the pros and cons to using a template style library. Uh, on the pros, well, hey, somebody else wrote it. I don't have to write it. Therefore, it just works. And I'm going to save a ton of time. Um, and it'll be customizable enough to, to sort of suit my needs. Uh, on the cons, it's kind of similar. It's like, well, somebody else wrote it, so it maybe doesn't work. Uh, and it'll take me a lot of time to figure out how to make it work. Uh, and at the end of the day, maybe it's not customizable enough to, uh, to work for me. So this is my sort of snarky trade-off list. My, my real trade-off list, um, on the pro side, it really, uh, it really does save a ton of time if you, if you need to make a scatter plot or a line chart and you just sort of grab an off-the-shelf library and say, make a scatter plot, um, you know, basically you're done. And very often you can get very close, you know, sort of 80% or almost 100% of the quality level you need for whatever it is that you're doing by using an off-the-shelf uh, library. And sure, most of the time it actually is customizable enough. You know, if what you're doing is you have a web page and you want to put a graph in the middle and you want the colors of the lines to match the theme of your website, that's amazing. If you're making a prototype, that's great. You know, you've just saved yourself a ton of time. On the flip side, depending on your circumstance, um, sometimes you need that extra 20% of, of, of control over what the output looks like. You know, if you're working for a very, very demanding customer or you are a very demanding customer and you need the graph to look a very specific way or you need, you know, the output to, to be pixel perfect, uh, that, that might be a problem for you if you use an off-the-shelf um, uh, charting library. And I mean, this is kind of the case for, for any, any uh, off-the-shelf software usage. Uh, but one of, the, one of the biggest cons I find for using a template style library is that uh, they have a very, often a very specific data input format. So if you need to feed data into this charting library, it needs to be a JSON array with, with the keys of your JSON <laughs> objects being laid out exactly like this. And so often, You'll uh, save yourself a whole bunch of time on actually doing the drawing part, but you'll have to write a whole bunch of code to reshape your data to fit into the charting library that you have. So these are kind of the pros and cons of, uh, of using a template style library for, for data visualization. So um, people like you know, actionable presentations, things that they can take away, not very theoretical, kind of like this is what Nick thinks the stack is type things. So uh, let me give you kind of my recipe for, for data visualization in JavaScript. This is a bit of a engineering focused uh, recipe because that's that's sort of my background. There's not a lot of design here, but um, the first step in sort of any visualization project, whether it's in JavaScript or some other language, is first of all, and I, and I really uh, can't stress this enough, you know, take a, take a good hard look at your data. Don't sort of assume like, oh, I'm gonna have data. Like, get the data, put it on your screen and look at it. You know, what is the format of your data? Is your data in an Excel file? You have a problem. You may have to export it to something else. Um, is it a CSV? Is it a JSON? What is what is this format? Uh, how much data do you have? Does it all fit in one screen? Are you visualizing 12 data points or are you visualizing 12 million data points? Slight difference, right? And then finally, you should ask yourself sort of what is the quality of this information? You know, like is this, uh, am I using Twitter to measure sentiment or am I using like a temperature sensor to measure temperature? Like how, how accurate is this data? Because that often will play into the types of visualizations that you might, you might want to make. The second step, um, and this is why I sort of belabored the point about the data to visual variable mapping at the beginning, is that you should write down what the mapping is between your data and the visual variables uh, that, that you want to make 
in order to produce this data visualization. Um, so you know, if you have kind of a temperature versus time kind of thing, it's a little bit it's a little bit simple. But like, if you want to make a time series, you are mapping time to the x-axis and you are mapping temperature to the y-axis. And if you want a line chart or something like that, then you know you should write that down. You can make actually a little sketch of what you think that this data visualization is going to turn out to look like. And the reason I suggest that you make a sketch after writing down what the mapping is, is that fairly often uh, what it turns out to look like will surprise you, right? I mean, the reason we use software to visualize data 99% of the time is because there's too much of it to do by hand and it'll be really slow, um, or uh, we're just not skilled enough with a ruler and, uh, and a protractor to make it, to make it work out. Uh, Sometimes I like flipping through, you know, uh, old books that have, you know, data visualizations that were drawn by hand. I'm like, oh my god, it must have taken them, you know, like three weeks to draw this one thing, and I can do this in four lines of JavaScript. Thank you. Um, so it's still important, I think, to make a sketch of what you think it's going to look like, because uh, it turns out very often the, the way the data is distributed means that my graph is completely different. You know, I expect it to have a nice blob of points, and it turns out that because everything's on a log scale, it's all in the top left corner or something like that. So I think it's important to make a sketch. And then you come to the sort of big decision technically, which is what kind of code do you want to be writing, right? Do you want to write JavaScript code that makes calls to a template style library? Do you want to be writing code that makes a bunch of calls into a middleware API where you're like mapping this axis to this kind of uh, this space and transforming the, the value of the, of the number of votes into a coordinate in a triangle? Uh, or do you want to be writing, you know, WebGL shader code that like actually figures out um, exactly how to tell the GPU how to render points uh, in, in on the screen? Um, and that's basically the, the the big technical decision you need to make. And so, in order to guide you, I provided sort of a few little slides of questions that you can ask yourself. So, if you are trying to figure out whether you want to be writing code that calls into a template style library, uh, first thing you do, you JavaScript data visualization libraries, you're going to get a list of lists, right? Google will provide you a long list of pages, and it'll be like 59 awesome charting libraries for JavaScript. And so, you know, when I start a new project and I and I don't and I choose not to use one of the libraries I already know how to use, um, I kind of ask myself, well, for this given library, um, if I go to their gallery page, is there something that looks like the sketch that I've drawn? You know, so for a lot of use cases, if you know you're making a time series line chart, you're going to have a time series line chart on the gallery. So check. Second question, for this given template style library, how far away is the data format that I've already got from the data format that this library expects? That's kind of like how much data manipulation code am I going to have to write to get what I've got into what this thing ex expects? And on the other end, how far away is the default output of this library from what I expect? Right? This is kind of the how far, how far away is this library from what I need? Um, and if it's, you know, depending on how far it is, does this library actually give me the, the level of control? Are there enough, you know, kind of knobs that I can tweak in this library to get the customizations that I want? Um, one, of the, one of my biggest pet peeves about charting libraries is when they don't provide an automatic legend, right? Like, if I make a chart and I have more than two colors on there, I'm going to want a legend. And if this charting library doesn't automatically generate a legend for me, I'm out, you know? So you have to kind of ask yourself, does this thing have all the options that I need in order to get the output that I want? This is where your sketch is kind of, uh, kind of helpful. And then you can ask yourself, you know, with this kind of data visualization stack in mind, what does this library use any kind of middleware that I can recognize? What uh, graphics API does this library use under the hood? So this is a kind of a question. I, I did a bit of a scan uh, last night just to see sort of who used what. And the, the easiest way to figure this out is you go to sort of uh, the main page or the gallery page of the library you're looking at. You fire up your developer console if you're in Chrome and you sort of mouse over the element, the, the graphic, and like, is it an SVG element? It's SVG. Is it a canvas element? It's canvas. That's often the easiest way to know because most of the time it's not on the main page. Like, this library is a wrapper over SVG. You're going to have to kind of go figure that out for yourself. Um, so, oh, sorry, one last point about middleware. Um, in my experience, a lot of charting libraries don't actually uh, use some underlying middleware that's a standalone project. So a lot of charting libraries will basically write their own code, their own trigonometry code to figure out sort of where points should be laid out in the canvas and the SVG. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's just, it means if I want to go hack into the code, I have to learn the way this person did it. Some, uh, some charting libraries, uh, C3JS, for example, is basically a charting library built on top of D3JS. So I know D3, I didn't know C3, but when I wanted to go in there and tweak something, I could because I knew the underlying uh, middleware. So in terms of middleware, 
um, the first question I kind of ask myself is like, what graphics API does this target, right? This is a piece of code that's supposed to help me use something. What is it helping me use? Is this, uh, is this like someone's helper library for helping them write SVG code or WebGL code or Canvas code? And how much time is this library going to help me? Um, will, will, how much time is this library going to save me compared to writing that code directly myself, right? That's the whole point of middleware is essentially sort of to save you time. <laughs> Or does using this library make my code more readable, right? So jQuery saves you a lot of time compared to writing DOM manipulation code, and it's much nicer to read. So jQuery wins on both of those. In my experience, and I'll editorialize for a second here, D3 has a lot of really neat stuff in it and allows you to you know, manipulate data in all sorts of ways. Uh, it saves a ton of time. I don't personally find the aesthetic of the resulting code at the end to be very nice. I find the D3 code to be very difficult to read. So I have kind of a love-hate relationship with it, right? It really accelerates the development process, but the output is kind of like, ooh, what, who's driving this code? Is D3 calling me? Am I calling D3 here? What's happening? So this is a question, uh, this is a question worth asking. Um, and then finally, I mean, this would apply to kind of any piece of software, but is it well-documented? If you're, if you're kind of looking for a Swiss Army knife that's gonna power most of your, most of your code here, do you get how, it's, how it works, or are you gonna have to go read the source? Um, it's kind of a question worth asking. And uh, when it's time to, to look at graphics APIs, um, it's, a very, it's pretty important, you know, it, it's getting better and better supported, but it's pretty important to ask yourself, which browsers and devices uh, support this graphics API? So WebGL is a little bit new. I don't even really remember, to be honest, whether WebGL is well supported on which iPhone or which Android device. Um, it, may, it may be all of them by now. But it's, it's, you know, it's worth asking, sort of, if I build this visualization using this graphics API, who will be able to use it? You know, older versions of IE didn't really like SVG that much. Um, it's always worth asking. And then does this graphics API have the right performance characteristics for my project? So if my project is to make you know, a social network visualization of all my friends and their friends and their friends and their friends, that's gonna be a lot of friends. Um, SVG is not gonna work out. Canvas may, I'm probably thinking about WebGL at this point if I need it to be interactive. On the other hand, um, if, if what I'm trying to do is using you know, 15 data points, um, but I really desperately need to be able to drag them around the screen, um, if I use WebGL, it might be very fast, but I'm, to, I'm going to have to write a whole bunch of middleware code or find a whole bunch of middleware code to give me that drag and drop interaction that I need. So the last question is sort of like, if I use this graphics API, how much middleware code am I gonna have to find or write uh, for this project? So this, uh, this sort of, List is kind of how I think about when I when I have a new visualization project in mind. Um, I often do this sort of for my own experience and for my own pleasure. So I will use usually to try and use a technology that I haven't used before, and I'll kind of run through this list. I'm like, okay, I want to make a map of, you know, the last project I, I did uh, was a, a map where I put one point on the screen for every uh, every physical address in Montreal, and I wanted it colored by the house number. So I ended up using, I didn't, I didn't end up doing this in JavaScript because I ran out of time. I used, uh, I used R, but uh, that turns out to be, you know, on the scale of 100,000 points. Probably could do that in SVG, but if you wanted to make it mouse over, it wouldn't work out. Probably something, you know, I would target Canvas or I would target WebGL. And I don't really want to play with the Canvas API because I find it kind of gross. And WebGL is a little scary. So I might find some sort of, you know, middleware because I doubt that there exists any libraries that help you put, you know, dots on house numbers in Montreal or something like that. That's kind of the, the mental process that I go through when I think about a particular project and how I'm going to choose the technologies to use it. Um, so hopefully this presentation has been, uh, has been useful to you guys and provides a bit of a mental model for, for how to reason about uh, approaching a data visualization project in JavaScript. Uh, and generally my conclusions are that uh, given the sort of state of the world and the state of the web today, uh, it's an awesome time to be, a, to be a JavaScript developer if you're into data visualization because um, J you know, JavaScript is essentially the technology of choice for doing some really neat stuff. Um, the New York Times has, has done uh, JavaScript developers the world over a huge service by having an awesome graphics department that makes all sorts of interactive graphics. And out of that department came CoffeeScript, which is probably my favorite dialect of JavaScript, and D3, so we have a lot to thank them for. Uh, and, um, you know, essentially, providing an outlet for essentially creativity on the, behalf, on the part of JavaScript developers to be able to make really nice and engaging images and understand data sets better. And this is me.
I guess I have time for questions. Yeah. Can't see anything. <laughs> Way in the back. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. Uh, so the question is around accessibility and, uh, and visualization. Um, accessibility is a little bit difficult uh, for visualization because essentially the, the, one of the main, um, sorry, I'll preface this by saying I haven't put a lot of thought into this question. I'm kind of making it up as I go and I don't have a lot of expertise in that particular area. But my instinct is to say that data visualization is essentially um, making use of the fact that someone can see to make, uh, to make data visible. So if someone uh, has difficulty seeing, there's just kind of a natural barrier there. So I would say at the very least you should take into account your audience when you're making uh, some kind of visualization. If you know that uh, people aren't able to see very well, you should make things bigger. Uh, you should certainly take into account uh, color uh, when, you're, when you're doing data visualization. Um, when I talked about mapping data to visual variables, in the interest of time, I sort of truncated the, the last part of it, which is that you should map data to visual variables that sort of are perceptually meaningful. Um, and so for a lot of people, uh, something like 10% of the male population, you know, the difference between red and green is not perceptually meaningful because they're colorblind. So when you're doing data visualization, you should always uh, keep in mind your audience and figure out a way to, to make it so that the distinctions, the visual distinctions in your output are, are per perceivable uh, and meaningful to your audience. Um, in terms of uh, the, the aspect of accessibility that's more like SEO and whether the uh, a screen reader is able to read it or whether a, a bot is able to read your visualization. Um, certainly one of the comparisons between SVG and Canvas is that SVG gives output which is accessible because it's essentially text. That said, um, no, I think that's it. so essentially if you have a screen reader and the screen reader is able to, to execute JavaScript, then there's you know at least some likelihood that the screen reader will be able to read the text within the SVG uh, that you've generated, which is important if you are sort of have a heavy text label um, type of visualization. And then the final point I'll make about that is that um, although I am part of, I guess, the web generation and I'm pretty good at, you know, aiming my mouse at small points on the screen and getting the hover, um, a lot of people aren't. And so sometimes when I show visualizations to people who are not as uh, familiar or as accurate with mousing or tapping or hovering, they find it a little bit annoying. And so the accessibility of highly interactive visualizations uh, can be a problem. Not everyone is sort of a Twitch gamer and is able to really mouse over the right point and get the, uh, the hover that you expected them to. Does that answer your question? <laughs>